section 3.1. Okay, so, <clears throat> so before I can describe each of these measures of central tendency, let me give you the symbol sigma summation, the symbol, well, pi here, I guess, which is the product symbol. And so this denotes uh, the fact that you should multiply all these numbers here. And so this is a multiplication of a whole bunch of an index set. So that's mathematical notation. Now let me give you some statistical notation. So if I'm talking about a sample, then notice that when I'm talking about samples, they have lowercase letters. So X will denote, uh, let's say, the a sample random variable. The corresponding sample random variable, I would write as a capital X if it was from a population. The sample size is denoted by lowercase m. Population size by uppercase m. So lowercase sample, uppercase, population. Suppose I have S, which denotes the sample standard deviation. Then for a population, the corresponding Greek letter to the letter S is the letter sigma. And so this is the lowercase letter sigma in the Greek alphabet. And so sigma corresponds to the population standard deviation. So the sample standard deviation is S, the population standard deviation is sigma. S squared, sample variance, sigma squared, population variance. R, sample linear coefficient, Rho, corresponding Greek letter, population. Sometimes for samples, we do not give separate letters, but what we do is a symbol. So sometimes for samples, we just put a bar above the sample um, random variable. And so that will say that's a sample mean. So the symbol means, well, that's your, your sample mean. Uh, the Greek letter mu is population mean. Uh, again, I have a symbol here, this little tilde. And so X with the tilde above it is the sample median, eta, uh, the Greek letter is the sample, that is the population median. <clears throat> so in general, lowercase letters, sample, uppercase population, or Greek letter, or, or lowercase Greek letters of population, except that they're, they're, they're always exceptions, except uh, there'll be well, one exception that will be, uh, you'll see. Um, so, except, so this is, this is a notation except when it doesn't work, except when they don't go by this notation. In general, uh, like 99% of the, the time uh, will be, statisticians use these uh, notations. 1% um, of the time, they'll, they'll, they won't use it, so. Mid-range. Let me do the mid-range. <clears throat> the mid-range is a measure of uh, the center that is midway between the highest and the lowest data value. And so the sample mid-range 
is the smallest sample value plus the largest sample value divided by two. The population mid-range has the same formula. It's the smallest population value plus the largest population value divided by two. So suppose I want to find the mid-range for 2, 3, 14, 18, and 20. Well, the smallest value is 2. The largest is 20. 22 divided by 2 is 11. So my mid-range is 11. Suppose I want to find the average age of a student at Los Angeles Valley College. So I could ask people, well, what's the uh, youngest person at Valley College? Um, the youngest person in any of my classes was nine years old, and he was in my linear algebra class, which is the highest math class. Um, and he started out two years earlier. Uh, in someone's class. I know he's like seven. But he was probably one of the youngest. He's the youngest I know of. So it's probably seven is the youngest. Uh, what's the oldest person I have taught? I think he was 102, 102 years old. Uh, there are probably people that are older than that. Uh, they're taking classes at uh, Valley. I'm not really sure. Um, if you ask students what the youngest uh, students' ages, they say 20. And then you ask them the, the oldest person on campus, they say 25, which is always amazing. When you look in class and you see that the majority of the students are over 25. And so you're wondering, how, how in the world do you say the oldest student is 25 when you're over 25? But they still say that for some reason. So let's just say uh, the youngest person is 15, the oldest is 85. Uh, so 100 divided by 250. That's a little bit high of an estimate. Uh, the average person at Valley, the average student at Valley College is female, uh, his, Hispanic female, uh, I believe 28 or between 28, 29, the 28, 29 year old Hispanic female is the average student at Valley College. So what are the advantages? The advantages of the mid-range is, uh, this can be used when you only have minimal knowledge of the data. So if you don't know anything about the data and the only thing you can do is estimate the maximum and minimum value, then you use the mid-range because it's only, that's all you need to estimate is the maximum and minimum value. Disadvantages as well, the only thing that you're using is maximum minimum value. So it's not a really good measure of uh, the center. Next, the mid range, uh, the, I'm sorry, next, the uh, root mean square, sometimes also called the quadratic mean. So the sample root mean square is the square root of the sum of x squared divided by n. It's the square root of the expected value of x squared, where the expected value of x is the sum of x over n. The population root mean square is the square root of the sum of x squared over n. It is the square root of the expected value of x squared, where the expected value of x is just the sum of x over n. So let's find the root mean square of the following set of data, 2, 3, 14, uh, 2, 3, 14, 18, 11. And so, oh, actually, I should probably, I'll do that in a second. So the root mean square is the square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 14 squared plus 18 squared plus 20 squared divided by, well, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 numbers. So divide by 5 and then take the square root. 13.6601105. If you have a TI30XA, you would input your data as follows. Suppose I have a 
84. So let me look at a TI 84. Okay, so let's just clear on all my data. Yes. So suppose I want to find the <clears throat> root mean square. So let's input my data. So let's do it as follows. Let's take second and then right above this parentheses. And let's put in input the data two comma three comma fourteen comma eighteen comma twenty in my parentheses click on store click on the second button one and then hit enter so I've stored all my data values in L1 and then let's go to, let's take the square root of, go to list, click on my arrow keys, and click on me, that's the third one down, and then take L1, square it, I can end my parentheses if I want, then hit enter. 13.6601 uh, Okay, good. Let's do Excel. Let me go to Excel. So let's say that this is my X values. So my X values were two, three, 14, 18, 20. Okay, so two, four, five numbers. Let me name this range. Now let's name it X and hit enter. Okay, so I did first, let me do, let me write everything down. So the first one I did was the mid range. So the mid range uh, was the uh, largest value. Where's my equal sign? Equal. My minimum value plus my maximum value divided by two. Okay, that was my mid range. My root mean square. So now let's find the root mean square. And so my root mean square is the square root of the sum of the squares divided by how many numbers there are. Thirteen point six six. Maybe we should make that bigger. Thirteen point six six zero one six one one. Okay. Uh, let's go to Mathematica. Professor. Yes. Uh, can you put the uh, uh, one more time the formula that you input in Excel for uh, root mean square, please? Yes, there it is. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Stupid me, I have to share. Uh, I'm looking on my screen. You can't see it. Sorry, there. <laughs> sorry. There it is. There's the formula. It is equal. You got to put the equal first. And then it's the square root, so SQRT, parentheses, sum of the squares, so sum squares, and I call my data value, my set of data X. 
could also just okay. do it as a range over n. And I did that just by counting how many there were. So I counted those. Thank you. And really, that should be the same. So it really doesn't, I don't know why I called it. So I didn't put any bad data in there. So uh, you could just say count. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's do Mathematica. I said Mathematica. Let's go to Mathematica. So the good thing about, so Mathematica obviously is a mathematical program. Uh, does everything exactly. Um, it also has a lot of data that's curated uh, from every every database in the world, basically. Uh, so it has a lot of data you can look at. Uh, root. Oh, oh let, let's call let's call x something. So my data, I'll call the data two x. So two, three, fourteen, eighteen, twenty. And let me not echo that. So I'll put a colon, semicolon, so I don't echo. Uh, okay, so 2, 3, 14, 18, and 20, I'll call that x. So let's determine the root mean square, root mean square. It always is just one. However, you would say it, it's all as one word where they, they, they put everything together and capitalize the first letter. The root mean square of x is, yeah. So exactly, uh, the square root of uh, 933 over uh, 5. Uh, let me do this numerically. So uh, n for numerically. And I don't know, let's say how many places. Uh, 11 places. 13.660. Uh, one zero five three. Okay, so uh, oh R, let's do R. R is a very popular uh, program for statistics, and so let's call. Oh, let's again. Let's input your data into something called X. So. I'll store it in the following column, uh, 2, 3, 14, 18, 20. Unfortunately, R is very unit-like, so it's very close. It, it's, it's, you can tell it's Unix roots, uh, which was from the, the S roots, which were from the Unix roots. Um, so a lot of these things may not be as obvious. So I'll do the square root of the mean of x squared. 13.66016. Here it is. OK, so that gives you uh, differing technologies to be able to figure out uh, some things. Oh, I should do it here, wait. I should also say, um, stat test. Probably do it there. Okay, let's see if I can do that. Uh, let's see if I, to there. That's stat disk online. Okay, so stat disk online. Aha, good. So if you go to stack disk, you will, now they do everything online. So this is stack disk online, sign in. And so let me clear my data. 
Okay, so what was my data? I'm not going to put in my data. Uh, two, three, 14. Okay, come on. There it is. Two, three, 14, 18, 20. Okay, there. So now let's determine. Chug, chug, chug. Okay, there it is. Uh, column one. So it tells, there it is. Uh, let's see. Root mean square. Uh, here it is. Root mean square. Here's my root mean square. Yeah. They give you a lot of stuff. Uh, so they give you the, the, a lot of stuff. We'll go over it eventually. But for right now, we're only looking at the root mean square. Oh, and they gave you they, oh, the first thing we, yeah, we did the mid range. So they gave you the mid range, which we found to be 11. And the next one that we found, which was the root mean square, which is uh, 13.66016. I don't think they'll give me any other, they'll give you the median. And that's about it for measures of central tendency. Yeah, that's it. Um, okay, so there you don't have a lot of choice what to give because they just give it to you all at once. Okay, so this is, uh, I forget how, how did I get it? It was under a data. So data and explore data. So data. And then you explore that. And I think it was called something. Uh, explore data, it's descriptive statistics. Okay. Now let me go back. Okay, so. Everyone. Oh, you are seeing the screen when I'm typing. Okay, so on stat desk, you just input your data and go to the data menu uh, and then click on explore data descriptive statistics. That gives you stuff. So where do you use when do you use root mean square? Root mean square is used in physical applications. For example, voltages and currents. The root mean square gives more weight to larger values as compared to the smaller values. So if you want to give a lot of weight to your larger values, you use a root mean square. So why would that be important in currents and voltages? Well, you don't want to blow up your brand new uh, computer because, uh, you know, all of a sudden there's a surge in your electricity, you know, so you don't want that when you plug things into the wall, you don't want things to blow up, you know, you don't want them to catch fire. So you want that, you know, that, so if you look here, if it says, you know, it's a whatever, 30 volts or whatever, that means that the root mean square is 30. So they, they are giving all those estimates as a root mean square. So they, on average, you really should never, you know, so giving weight, lots of weight to the, you know, the fact that maybe it's, you know, has a quite high value. You want to give all the, a lot of weight to that so that you, don't normally go much, much larger than what they stated. Because going much larger than what they state can have really bad consequences. Being a little lower uh, than what they say is, is not horrible. You know, so your, you know, so your computer, you know, looks a little faint. It, you know, the screen doesn't, doesn't, you know, isn't as bright as it should be or whatever, because it doesn't have enough electricity. Eh, okay, you can live with that. Uh, you can't really live with the fact that your computer catches fire. And so you want to use, 
root mean square for voltages for currents uh, for things like uh, in a hardware store if you go you know like a, um, a a bolt or whatever you don't want the bolt to be such that well sometimes you put the bolt inside the you know your the nut sometimes it fits and sometimes it doesn't because you know there's this uh, even though it's saying that it should fit it doesn't because you know there's this variation and they didn't take into account that they should put a lot of weight on what's the biggest one, because if it's too big, it doesn't fit. If it's a little bit smaller, it's okay, it still fits. Maybe it, 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 it will strip the, you know, the bolt or whatever, but that's much better than it won't fit at all. So there's, you know, hopefully it, it isn't so varying that it will strip it, but at least it's, it's, it's not as bad. So. Uh, you use the root mean square when you want to put more weight on the larger data values. So those situations that you want to put more weight on the larger data values, when you say average, you're really doing a root mean square. And that is the average that you're taking. Harmonic mean. So now let's look at a different mean, a different average. So when we say average, well, what do we mean? Well, maybe sometimes we'll mean the harmonic mean. And so the sample harmonic mean is defined as n divided by the, uh, the sum of one over x. It is the reciprocal of the expected value of the reciprocals. Similarly, for the population harmonic mean, it is n over the sum of 1 over x. It is the reciprocal of the expected value of the, of the reciprocals. Let me say that again. Uh, it is the reciprocal of the expected value of the reciprocals. Say that fast 20 times. OK, so, so let's do the following example. Find the harmonic mean of the following set of data. 2, 3, 14, 18, 20. So the same set of data. And so the harmonic mean is, well, there are five data values. So five divided by one over two plus one over three plus one over 14 plus one over 18 plus one over 20. 4.9489395139513. So let's use the TI 84. Luckily, we have already input the data values into L1. And so that's fine. Let's go to list, second, list. Go over to math, go over to mean. Intake, L1, reciprocal, close parentheses, reciprocal, enter. Four point. Nine four eight nine three nine five one three. That is the harmonic mean. Let's use Excel. And so the harmonic mean. So in Excel, I'm actually sort of listing them all down so you can sort of compare. So let's see, in Excel, I'm going to do the harmonic mean. So harmonic mean of, well, in this case, I'll call it X. 4.94893951. So that's the harmonic mean. Let me do Mathematica. Let's find the harmonic mean. And I called it X. So harmonic mean is, oh, again, they give you the exact value. So the harmonic mean 
6,300 over 1,273. Let me do it numerically. So let's call it N. Uh, let's do it to 11 places. Oops. Oh, I know why that. So I did put there. Where's the H? There. So harmonic mean is 4.948939513. That's your harmonic mean. Uh, let's do R. And so one over the mean of X. Oh, 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 wrong. One over the mean of one over X. Okay, that's correct now. 4.94894. And so that's a harmonic mean. It's your circle. It's the reciprocal of the expected value of the reciprocals. And you really can't do that for um, a stack disk. It doesn't allow you. So let's go back. It only just outputs what it wants to output. Okay. Ah. So notice the harmonic mean gives more weight to smaller values. So if you want to somehow give an average that somehow gives a lot of weight to the smaller values and much less weight to the larger values, then you use the harmonic mean. It's used for speed and for other rates of change. Professor? Yes. Um, I have a question regarding about the harmonic weight, I mean, um, uh, harmonic mean. Uh, <clears throat> when you said other, other rates, uh, does it specifically has to do with distance or can it be like uh, wages or any rates at all? Yeah, in other words, I think that you should actually have, a, you, they should use harmonic mean for income. They don't, they actually use a median, but I think they should be using the harmonic mean uh, because it gives more weight to the smaller data and the smaller values. And so I think it's a better measure of uh, central tendency. But yeah, you could use it for wages. That's a good, that's a good thing that uh, it can be used for. Even though, as I say, uh, they, when they're talking about wages, uh, when they talk about the average, they usually uh, say median wage, median income. So usually they use median rather than harmonic mean uh, I myself disagree that they should use harmonic mean, but uh, everyone else uses uh, median, so uh, you can't really go against everyone else. So, so that's what they use. Okay, <clears throat> geometric mean. So the geometric mean is defined as follows. So the sample geometric mean is the nth root of the product of all the data values. It is 10 to the power of the expected value of the log of your data values. The population geometric mean is the nth root of the product of all your data values. It is 10 to the power of the, um, X, well, the expected value of the logarithm of your data values. <clears throat> Please note that you should assume you should only use a geometric mean <clears throat> if all your data is positive. So you should never have any non-positive uh, values when computing a population of uh, when computing a geometric mean. So. Let's find a geometric mean for, well, 
uh, 2, 3, 14, four, uh, 18, 20. Same set of data values. And so <clears throat> to compute the geometric mean, let's take, let's multiply 2, 3, 14, 18, 20 together, and then take the fifth root since they're five numbers. 7.8725668584. So let's do this on the TI84. <clears throat> Let me compute. Two second, right above the log is the tenth of the power of the mean. So second list, go to math, the third one down of my data, which was stored in L1. Uh, oh, I have to do the logarithm of L1. And that should give you 7.8725668584. <clears throat> Let me go to Excel. Okay. And so geometrically. So let's find the geometric mean. And again, I sorted, I, I stored all my data values in X. So geometric mean. 7.8725668. So um, before going on to Mathematica, notice the following. So, so far, well, well, no, I, I'll say it at the end. Okay, so let me go to Mathematica. So I want the geometric mean. Of my data. Two times the uh, fifth root of three, uh, the fifth root of three cubed times 35. And so uh, let me look at this numerically. 7.8725, uh, seven. or I can actually do it this way, numerically, to let's say 11 places. So 7.8725668541. And so that's my geometric mean. <clears throat> Let's go to R. Let's find the geometric mean. So let's multiply everything together. Product. By everything together to the power of one over n. This should be seven point eight seven uh, five eight seven two five six seven. And again, I don't think you can, um, oh, I could also say this. Uh, doing it similar to what we did in the, in the previous uh, problem, like in oh, uh, TI-84, 10 to the power of the mean of the log So you get the same answer, 7.872567. <clears throat> okay, so let's go back. So 
So note, the geometric mean is the nth root of the product of x. So if you take the log of both sides, log of the geometric mean is the log of this. Well, a nth root is the same as an exponent of one over n. I can bring exponents out in front of my logarithms by the properties of logarithm. So it's one over n times the log of the product. But the log of a product is the same as the sum of the logs. So it's one over n times the sum of the logs. But this is just an average. So this is just the expected value of the log of x. Therefore, the geometric mean is 10 to the power of the expected value of the log of x. So note that this gives more weight to the log of values, but not as much weight to log of values as the root mean squared. So it gives a little bit of weight, but not a lot of weight, just barely. So it's often used in business and economics for finding average rates of change, average rates of growth, the average ratios. Uh, again, you should not use this uh, if your data has a non-positive value. So the arithmetic mean. <clears throat> so the arithmetic mean is, well, you know what, even though we haven't discussed it. So suppose I ask you to find the average of two and six. Well, how would you find the average of two and six? Well, you do two plus six divided by two, eight divided by two is four. That is the arithmetic mean. So the average that you have seen in your grade, in grade school was the arithmetic mean. So let me define it. So uh, the sample mean is just, uh, sometimes we denote the sample mean by E, the expected value of X. Notice it's a, a lowercase X, denoting the fact that it's a sample, or by X with a little bar over it to denote the fact that it is a mean is just the sum of x over n. The population mean is, well, sometimes denoted by the expected value, e of x. But in this case, the x is um, capitalized to denote the fact that it's uh, for a population uh, random variable. And uh, another notation is mu. So the Greek letter mu here is a, another symbol for the population mean. It is a sum of x over n. So you stat, add up all your uh, data values and divide by your population size. So let's do an example. The counts of chocolate chips in different cookies are determined. The mean Find the mean of the first five counts for Chips Ahoy regular cookies. 22 chips, 22 chips, 26 chips, 24 chips, 23 chips. So let's add all the data values. 22, 22, 26, 24, 23, 117. And then divide it by how many data there are. There are five chips, uh, five cookies. So I'll divide by five. 117 divided by 5, 23.4. So let's do the following example. Suppose I have the following data set, the same data set, 2, 3, 14, 18, 20. Determine the sample mean. <clears throat> and so we'll add up 2 plus 3 plus 14 plus 18 plus 20, and then divide by five. And so uh, we have here, <clears throat> uh, so 228 divided by five is, no, no, uh, is 
uh, 11.4. And so let's do this on the TI-84. So let's go to list, go to me of L1. And that, 114, uh, 11.4. I could also do stat, go to calc, click on the first one. L1, oh, that's not going to be, I, I, want, I don't want that. And so to list is L1, calculate. And so I get 11.4. I also get a whole bunch of other things. I get the sum of x, sum of x squared, some stuff you don't know yet, uh, standard deviation uh, for a sample, popular standard deviation. I have that the uh, sample size was five, and then other stuff you don't know, the five number summer, the minimum value of uh, your data was two, its maximum was 20. Uh, halfway, the midpoint was 14, uh, halfway between those was 2.5, halfway between those was 19. Okay, so that's another way of calculating the mean. Let me go to Excel. Let's go to Excel. Excel. Let's click on the wrong thing. Okay, Excel. So let's do the mean. So the average, 11.4. So, <clears throat> so notice your root mean square gave a lot more values, a lot more weight to the larger data values. 4.9 gave a lot more weight to the smaller data values. 7.8 gave a little bit more weight, but not that much more weight to the larger values. And then the 11.4, I'll just sort of, doesn't give any, it, it just adds them all up, doesn't, doesn't care if they're bigger or small values. So, and then the mid-range just looked at the smallest and largest data values. So, um, use mid-range when you don't know a lot about anything. A uh, root mean square, when it's very important that you give weighting on the larger data values, Harmonic mean, when you want to give a lot of weight on the smaller data values. Geometric mean, when you want to give some weight, some additional weight on the larger values, but not that much weight on the larger values. All of the situations, well, most of, most, all of the situation, you do the mean. Let me do uh, Mathematica. Find the mean uh, fifty seven point five uh, fifty seven over five. Oops, eleven point four and R. Let's find the mean. 11.4 and here it is. Stack disk. In 
And so, well, unfortunately, it gave you everything. So it gave the mean already uh, 11.4. <clears throat> so you can't really, oh, but it does, here's the sum of x and the sum of uh, x squared. And of course, they gave you the same thing as the TI-83. We'll discuss that in the future. And then things that uh, we'll be discussing in the future, uh, which are not measures of center, they're measures of dispersion. And things in the future, things way in the future. <laughs> and here's the normal quantile plot, plot, which we barely looked at uh, before. Okay, so. So the advantages of the mean is that, well, uh, the mean is calculated by using all the values of your data. So we didn't throw out any values of the data, like what we did with the mid-range. The mean varies less than the other measures of uh, uh, central tendency when taken from the same population and the measures are all uh, computed. So it has the property that it really has the less, the least amount of uh, sample variance. The mean is used for computing other statistics such as the uh, variance. The mean is unique. Well, we haven't seen measures of central tendency that aren't unique. Uh, we will in the next, the next uh, measure central tendency. It's something that's not, oh well, that's not unique. Actually in two measures more that we're looking at. And we get something that's not unique. <clears throat> Disadvantage. Uh, the mean cannot be used for open-ended frequencies. So if you remember, an open-ended frequency was when we had like an outlier or something and we couldn't put all of our data into a uh, frequency distribution with equal class width, unless then the, you know, the, dis the frequency distribution will look really horrible uh, because it was distorted by that outlier. So instead we'd, we said, well, it was some number and above for one of the, uh, for the biggest class, or let's say for the lowest class, it was some number and below so that I could somehow grab those other things that were long, you know, either too small or too large so that I could make my distribution have equal class width and it looked nice. Okay, so the mean is affected by extremely high or low values. And it may not be appropriate uh, to use as an average in such situations. And so it is very sensitive to every data value. So one or more extreme value can affect it dramatically. It is not a resistant measure of central tendency. So suppose I wish to find the sample mean of students' incomes. So I'll ask everyone, well, what's your income? You know, $5,000, 2000 15000 So I add up everyone's uh, incomes and their average income in this class is $12,000 a year. In walks Bill Gates and he says, please, 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 can I uh, add your statistic class? Uh, Melinda has told me to get off the couch and uh, to get to finish my degree. Um, I, you know, as you may know, uh, I, I had to, you know, uh, skip out of college. You know, I was in college and I, I, just sort of left college, uh, you know. Uh, I, matter of fact, I was a math major that I said, well, uh, I, maybe this new thing called computers uh, has something going with it. Maybe I'll do something in computers. I switched to computers and then uh, like a semester later, I left to form this company, the little company off in uh, New Mexico. Uh, and, and, you know, to see what's happening now that, that I'm here in, in Seattle. Uh, Melinda's 
you know, telling me to get off the couch. Uh, I should really go back to college. So I asked Harvard and they said, nah, you can't go come back into, you know, uh, taking classes until you, you have your, your statistics prerequisite. So uh, can I sit in? Sure, well, uh, just don't, don't say too much. Uh, and so let's figure out what everyone's uh, average is. So uh, 2,000, 5,000, da, 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 uh, 120 billion. And so we take the average and now the average, you know, in our class, the average salary is $2 billion a year, is 2 billion. So uh, if you look at that, well, that's probably not a good measure of, the, uh, of what people's income is because uh, most people income taking this class is not $2 billion. And so uh, a better way of doing this, not the best way, but a way that they usually do it is by doing the median. And so the median is found by sorting your data values and then finding the middle of the data. So the median is usually denoted by a little tilde or eta for the uh, population median. It is not affected by extreme values. It is a resistant measure of central tendency. So how do I find the median? First, sort the data from smallest to largest. Well, you can sort the data either from largest to smallest to smallest to largest. I always do smallest to largest. I think almost everyone does. I would say everyone, I, I know of no one that does it uh, the other way around. So sort your data smallest to the largest. Next, determine the position of the median, then compute the median. So let me explain on, well, our same set of data that we've been looking at forever. So suppose I have the following set of data. 2, 3, 14, 18, 20. Let's compute the median. So I want to first figure out where the, where the middle is. So if I look here, it's already been sorted. Good. Next, I want to figure out the middle value. So the middle value seems to be here, which is in the first, second, third position. How can I do that? Well, I'll do it by the following formula. Let K equal N plus one over two. So I have five numbers. Five plus one is six divided by two is three. So the median should be the number in the third position. So I take the number in the third position, 14, and that is my median. So now let's do the following example. Let's find the median. So I have the numbers 5.4, 1 1.1, 0 0.42, 0 0.78, 0 0.48, 1.1.66. Sort the data. So let's sort my data. Oops. 0 0.42, 0 0.48, 0 0.66, 0 0.73, 1.1. 1 .1. Oh, there's another one. 1.1 1 .1 and 5.4. Okay, so now I have here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven numbers. Seven plus one is eight divided by two is four. So I want to find the number in the fourth position. One, two, three, four. 0.73. So my median is 0.73. Notice I have three numbers below and three numbers above, so it's in the middle. So my middle number is 0.73. So now let's do another example. Uh, uh, 5.4, 1.1, 0.42, 0.73. 0.48, 1.1. Okay, so let's sort the data. 
Okay, good. So now I have one, two, three, four, five, six, plus one is seven divided by two is 3.5. So now it should be in a 3.5 position. One, two, three, point five. So it's somewhere here. So now the question is, well, what do you do if it's halfway in between? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> and so uh, there are many ways <clears throat> that we will deal with this. One way is the obvious way. You take the two numbers and divide by two to give you that the median is not 0.915. There are objections to that because, well, it's not in the data set. Or if you, even if it is, uh, the objection is not that it's in, not in the middle. Well, maybe there are other ways to calculate the middle. So there, unfortunately, there is no agreed, away, agreed upon way on how to do this. So we'll discuss that more later. So the example, let's do the same set of data. 2, 3, 14, 18, 20, 84. So the median is, well, uh, let's see, there are two, four, six numbers. Six plus one is seven divided by two is 3.5. So it's a number in a 3.5 position. Everything's been sorted. So it's halfway between 14 and 18, which is 16. So my median is 16. So let's do this on my TI 84. So let's compute, by the way, we've already computed the medians. 14. Oh, let's just see if my data is correct. Uh, oh, my data is different. Ah, ah, a different data. 2, 3, 14, 2, 3, 14, 18, 20, oh, and 84. Okay. A different data. Okay, so let's compute. So, so don't look at what I was going to look at because the data is different. So let's find the medium. So second list. Go to median is the fourth one down. So let's find the median of L1. 16. Okay, so uh, I have here 16, which is good. <clears throat> I'm not guaranteed I'm going to get the same answer. Okay, Excel. Let's go to Excel. It's always exciting to see if I'm going to get the same number. Okay, the medium. I'm not guaranteed that I'm going to get the same answer all the time. Oh, so I want uh, 84 to be intended to this. So let's define this now as x. No, let's define, let's go to uh, function, okay, I mean, let's define this x in a new way. Oops, that's that. Okay, so now that's x. Wait, wait, wait. Let's see. Did I define that as X? Okay, good. Somehow it, it didn't come through. Okay, so that's my X. Oh, of course, now all my data, all my previous things recalculated, they gave me different answers. Okay, so now um, uh, let's find the median. 
So now it's a different x. Maybe I should redefine the x. Okay, so uh, 16, which I think is what I, we got from before, yeah. Okay, let's do Mathematica. So, let's redefine my x. Let's add 84 to this. Oops. So, let's do uh, the medium. so far. And let's do R. So that X, let's call it the new things. It's 2, 3, 14, 15, 20, 24. And I'll find the median. 16. Good. Okay. So that gave us the median. <clears throat> so the bad thing about the median is there is no precise mathematical definition of median. There are at least a dozen different definitions that can be used to compute the median. It is not sensitive to outliers. So it is used for income prices homes. However, it is sensitive to the center of the distribution. That's why I don't think it should be used. Uh, the median can be computed for ordinal depth. So the mode. The mode, sometimes denoted by MO, is the value that occurs most frequently. So let's find the mode of 38437898. So eight occurs three times. So this is the mode. So my mode is eight, it is unimodal because there's only one answer. Um, let's look at the mode of 384378. Notice that I have two threes and two eights. And so those are the ones that occur most often. So therefore the mode is two numbers. There are two modes, three and eight. So this is said to be bimodal because there are two modes. So you make this not, might not be unique. So the mode might not be unique. Next, suppose I have the mode of 2, 3, 14, 18, 20. There are no repeats. Therefore, we say that this has no mode. So <clears throat> the mode is used when the most typical case is desired. It's the easiest average to compute. Uh, actually, one of the most difficult, however, to find uh, on a, a computer because they usually don't calculate the modes. Uh, the mode can be used when the data is nominal. So if I ask, what is the average language spoken in the United States? And they say English. Well, how did they figure that out? They didn't, you know, take the uh, mid-range. They didn't take the largest value and smallest value. I mean, you know, how do you sort languages? You know, there's no way to say that uh, you know, the, you know, English is bigger than, you know, if I say that I speak English, oh, that's a greater number, that's a greater value than someone says that they speak Portuguese or something. No, I mean, there's no way to sort language. Uh, similarly, uh, so you can't do any, any sort of uh, mid-range or, or, or medium because you can't sort the data. Uh, similarly, uh, you can't add, you can't say, well, what's English plus Portuguese? Spanish, I don't know. 
Um, so you can't add them. So there's no way to do any of those other computations, you know, uh, where we added things. You can't take reciprocals, you can't square. So you can't take, uh, you know, uh, you can't multiply them together. So you can't take uh, root mean square, harmonic mean, geometric mean, uh, the mean. So you can't take any, uh, you can't take any value. So, so far, none of those, but you can take the mode. You can say, what's the most typical case? So when they say the average, when I said that the average person uh, at uh, Valley College was a female, when I said average, uh, the average was actually a um, mode. When I said that the average uh, was uh, 28, uh, I believe that was a, uh, that was a mean. Uh, and when I said that the average uh, was Hispanic, that was a mode. So at, when they say average, it could mean a lot of different uh, a lot of differing measures, essential tense. So the mode is not always unique. The data set can have more than one mode. And it may not exist. So the trend. So now, how do we retain all the good properties of the mean, but get rid of the bad properties uh, that, that such as outliers and things like that. Well, we can do the trim. And so if you suspect that your data is in error for large, both large and small values, then what you should do is trim your mean. And so, it has all the good aspects of the mean, and it is not sensitive to outliers. Since you've thrown away the outliers, it's not sensitive to them. So for the 10% trim mean, this would mean that you would trim the largest 10% and the smallest 10% of your data. So usually people will either do a 10 or 20% trim mean, where they are trimming the largest 20% and the smallest 20% of your data. And then they look at the middle 60% of your data that remains. So 10% uh, trim me if you uh, suspect that most of your data is correct, but the ones on both ends are incorrect, like 10% on each side are incorrect. Then you trim the 10%. And um, Let's do the following. Uh, determine the 20% trim mean. So uh, suppose I have the following set of data, negative 20, 3, 14, 18, 20, uh, 2000. And suppose that this is ages of students. Um, uh, ages of your children, no, no, these, these are the ages of your children. So suppose I ask you for the ages of your children and uh, I get the following set of data. I probably think that your child is not 20 years, negative 20 years old. And this other child is probably not 2000 years old. So I suspect that this data is corrupted and that these values of negative 20 and 2000 are not correct. Um, and I suspect that these probably are, hopefully these are at least I have no reason to suspect that these values are in error. And so uh, I will find the average of those values. Uh, please, yeah, so note that uh, uh, in a former lifetime, I was uh, the head, I ran the uh, placement office for a mathematics department at a um, district. And, um, <clears throat> When I was doing this, uh, I had access to all uh, records for all students in the district. I was actually the, there were only two people in the district that had access to all the database. Uh, I was one of the two people. 
of course, I couldn't, you know, I was not allowed, even though I had access and the ability. I was not a, I, I should not and did not change any data in the database. Uh, well, I input data, but, you know, uh, but uh, I didn't change data that I didn't know uh, that I, I didn't want to change. Uh, and so uh, uh, if I looked at, uh, say, ages of students, uh, so one of the things about a large database, especially a database of things involving students, is that once you input data into a database for students, uh, you can't really change it. So uh, even if we had uh, the ability to change it, we would not change it. Uh, even if we knew it was an error, the only person, quote unquote, who could change your uh, data in your database would be through a student. And a student would need to specifically request that they are, uh, that they want the data changed. And I think it has to go through a gigantic process. This is a gigantic process. Everything in the school has a gigantic process. And finally, they would, you know, for them to be able to change it. But uh, I did notice that lots of students had ages that were in the billions of years. Um, and that's because students, uh, well, every anyone, but in particular students, uh, they don't read the instructions. So a lot of times for their age, they'll put their social security number or their phone number. And so sometimes the age would come out negative or would come out in the billions of years. So having this as ages is probably quite, is quite, at least in my experience, was quite typical that you would get these weird answers, these weird inputs uh, that occurred. Yeah, actually I was also looking at a database of uh, doctors, a physician, well, actually all healthcare workers uh, in the United States. And uh, lots of missing data, lots of, I guess physicians, especially physicians, uh, they probably are busy and they, they don't read instructions. So not only students don't read instructions, doctors don't read instructions, physicians don't read instructions. So it's amazing how much, how bad and corrupted that database was. Okay, so um, the larger the database, the more corrupt it is. Um, corrupted, meaning, meaning not that it's, it's corrupted, meaning that, that there's, there's incorrect data in, in, in your database. So <clears throat> not meaning that people are corrupt, meaning that the data is corrupt. So hopefully that, that, that was clear. That, I was talking about data. Okay, so. <clears throat> Suppose you want to determine the 20% trim mean. So I'll take, there are five numbers here. So 20% of five is one. So I'll take the largest data value, 2000, the largest data, the smallest data value, negative 20, and get rid of it. And only look at the mean for the remaining data. And so three, 14, and 18. So 11.6. So notice that if I change my data from the usual, from two to negative two, and from 20 to 2000, it really didn't change your mean. Our mean before was very similar to this. So getting rid of the top, the bottom 20%, top 20% didn't really change the essence of, of what the, the mean was. And now it has all the nice properties of the mean and it's not, uh, and it's now, and it's now resistant to outliers. So this gives a lot of, so now it, it's, it's actually a nice sort of measure of central tendency. Okay, so, hmm, I wonder if I should. So now we'll start to look at the mathematical part of this. Why don't I give you guys a 10 minute break? Yeah, I'll give you guys a 10 minute break. 
Let me give you guys a 10 minute break. Let's start back at 12 o'clock noon exactly, because uh, this is a good part to uh, have a little rest at. So your brain is nice and fresh. Uh, and I guess you got, you can get some nourishment, uh, something to drink, something to eat. Uh, so I'll, we'll start back at 12 o'clock noon. Uh, so 11, so 12 more minutes.
Professor? Yes. Um, I have a question on on, on trim rig, uh, trim mean. Mm -hmm. So um, to get the twenty percent, you divide uh, the total amount of of data input uh, divided by by the percentage as. So so say uh, oh here it is. Say you do a twenty percent twin mean. Uh huh. Then find how many numbers you have, mm -hmm. multiply it by 20%. That's the, num that's the amount of numbers you're going to get rid of. Oh, okay. Both ends. Both if you're doing 10% to me, you figure out how many numbers you have, and then take, multiply 10% of those, uh, that number, and get rid of 10% at each end. Okay, same with five percent. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Ah, just about time. Okay then. Let me go over first some property, the summation from your previous classes. So um, by the associative and commutative property of addition, we have the sum of x plus y is the sum of x plus the sum of y. And by the distributive property, we can factor out the constant from uh, each, well, whatever common factor is. A, we can factor out a common factor from your data. And so the sum of AX is just A sum of X. A here is a constant, it's that common factor. And next, the sum of one is n. So if I just add up n numbers, I get one. So <clears throat> let me give you some of the properties of the mean. And so first off, I have that the sum of x is equal to n times the mean of x. And so let's try to show this. So <clears throat> when I start a proof, I usually start with the letters PF to mean that I'm starting the proof. And then I, to denote the fact that I've ended the proof, I'll type in the letters QED to denote the fact that I'm done. Uh, quod error demonstratum, which means uh, thus it's been shown, so it's a, Roman mistranslation of a Greek. So this is a English mistranslation of a Greek, of a Roman mistranslation of a Greek uh, phrase. So it, in English, it sort of means, uh, and thus it has been demonstrated. And thus we've shown this. So quote er demonstratum uh, in Latin. So sum of x, well, I can divide, multiply and divide by the same amount. And so that's multiply and divide by n, but then the sum of x over n is just the mean, just a sample mean. And that's what I wanted to show. Similarly, the sum of x is just n times mu. And so let's try to show this. Well, again, the sum of x is just, well, uh, let's multiply and divide by n. Uh, so long, of course, I'm assuming here that n is uh, not equal to uh, zero. 
if n is zero, we don't have any data. So I guess it's still a true statement because there is no data. Um, assume that there is some data. And so you can multiply and divide by n. But again, uh, the sum of x over n is just mu. And so that's what I wanted to show. Uh, next. I have here that the sum of the deviations from the mean is always zero, which means that if I wanted to somehow measure the dispersion, the spread of my data from the mean, then I cannot just look at the deviation from the mean because that's always zero. So it doesn't give me a measure. It's always just equal to one value. So that doesn't distinguish between differing uh, data sets. So you do not use uh, dispersion to, well, you don't use deviation from the mean as a measure of dispersion because of this. So let's try to show this. Well, the sum of X minus the sample mean by the property of summation here, is just the sum of x minus the sum of the mean, but the mean is constant. So I can bring the mean out in front of the uh, summation. So it's just the sum of x, uh, the sum of the mean times the sum of one, but the sum of one is n. So this is the sum of x minus n times the, the uh, sample mean, but by property one, these are equal. And so the difference is zero. And that's what I wanted to show. Next, um, this also works for a population. So if you're trying to look at the uh, dispersion from the uh, population mean, you again should not be looking at the deviation from the population mean because the sum of the deviations from the population mean is always equal to zero. So that's not a good measure of dispersion. So the sum of x minus mu, again, using the properties of summation, is just the sum of x minus the sum of mu. But uh, the sum of mu here, since mu is a constant, I can bring the mu out in front of the summation here. So it's just mu times the sum of x, but then <clears throat> the sum of one is just n, but then n mu, well, then the sum of x by the second property here is just n mu. The n mu's cancel, so you get zero. So I've shown that the uh, dispersion, that the um, deviation, the sum of the deviations from the mean is just always equal to zero. Next, if n sub one and n sub two are sizes, sample sizes of two samples, and x one bar, x two bar are the means of these two samples, then the mean of the combined uh, group of these two samples is n1 x1 bar plus n2 x2 bar, all divided by n1 plus n2. So if, let's suppose that I tell you, well, the average for the females in the class for the first exam was 70. And the average for the number for the males in the class was 60. And there are 20 females in class and 10 males in class. Then you can say, well, what was the average, the overall average of class? Well, you can just plug into this formula. And you say, well, there were, I forget, 20 females, average 70, 
in 10 males, I mean 60 over was it 20 plus 10. And you play, and then you can figure out from there that the average was uh, 66.67. Okay. So you could figure out from those, from what I gave you, you could figure out the average for the class. Okay, so let's show this. Well, sample mean is just the sum of x over n, which is just, well, I have these two different groups, x1 and x2, so sum of x1 plus sum of x2 over. Well, again, I have these two different samples, so sample, so the total sample size is the sum of each of the sample sizes, so n1 plus n2. By the very first property here, I can figure out the sum of x. So the sum of x1 is just n1 times the uh, mean of x1. And similarly, by the first property that we showed, the sum of x2 is n2 times the uh, mean of x2, all divided by, well, the same thing, n1 plus n2. And that's what I wanted to show. Uh, next, um, we proved previously that if we were trying to look at the dispersion from the mean, that I shouldn't look at the deviation because the sum of the deviations from the mean was always zero. Let's look instead at this. For any distribution, S equaling the sum of X minus A quantity squared is minimized when A is the mean. So this says that if I look at the square deviation, the square deviation is minimized when we look at the sum of the square deviations for the sample mean. So if I want to measure a dispersion from the sample mean, I should really be looking at the sum of the square deviations. And that we'll be doing later today, maybe, or next week, uh, probably next week. We'll be doing next week, uh, we'll be looking at a measure of dispersion, which will involve the square deviation from the mean. So let's try to show this. First off, I have that S is equal to the sum of X minus A quantity squared. Well, I know from elementary algebra, um, I guess in grade school, no, 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 not grade school. That's, um, what's it called? Junior high, in, in, from junior high. I know that uh, the perfect square, tri I know the um, perfect square trinomial formula. Uh, the, one of the special product formulas. So I know that uh, when they taught me this in, uh, in uh, what was it called? Um, not grade school, uh, I just said it. Um, junior high. Uh, I know that when they taught this to me in junior high, that they said that I would always need to know this. Well, today is the day. Again, many times you've got to know this. So. Uh, x minus a quantity squared is, well, x squared minus 2ax plus a squared. And so um, by the property of summation from above, this is the same as the sum of x squared minus the sum of 2ax plus the sum of a squared. I can bring the constant minus 2a out, out in front of the summation. So minus 2a sum of x. I can also bring a squared, which is constant, on the front of the summation. So a squared sum of one. The sum of one by the properties of summation is n. Let me write this in descending order of a. So this is n a squared minus two a sum x plus the sum of x squared. I now notice that this 
is quadratic in A. Therefore, since it's quadratic in A, its graph looks like a parabola. Since the coefficient, the leading order coefficient, the coefficient of A squared is positive, in is a positive number, then it means that this parabola is pointing up. Since the parabola is pointing up, the minimum, this has a minimum. And the minimum will occur at the very bottom at the vertex. And so the minimum occurs at the vertex. And while we remember the formula for the vertex, it's x equal minus b over 2a. So our x's are actually called a's in this case. So a is equal to minus b. So here's the, here's the b. So the b is everything except for the a here. So it's a minus two some x. So that's b over two times a. A is in, well, the number in front of the a squared, which is n. The negative twos cancel. So I just have the sum of x over n. So the sum of x over n is the sample mean. And that's what you wanted to show. So we're done. Similarly, for a population. So, <clears throat> When trying to measure the dispersion from the mean, from the population mean, we should also use the sum of the square deviations from the mean. So for any distribution S equaling sum of X minus A squared is minimized when A is equal to mu. S is equal to sum of x minus a quantity squared by the special product formula. x minus a quantity squared is x squared minus 2ax plus a squared by the properties of summation. This is equal to the sum of x squared minus 2a sum of x plus the sum of a squared. Bring the a squared out in front of the summation. Sum of one is n, right in descending order. So S is equal to N A squared minus two A sum X plus sum X squared. This is again a parabola. This is quadratic in A squared. So it's a parabola. Since N is greater than zero, then this parabola here uh, is pointing up. So it has a minimum at the vertex. So A is equal to minus two minus B which is a minus two sum X all over two times the number in front of A squared N. Negative two cancels to so get sum of X over N, which is mu. And that's what I wanted to show. So when we are gonna be looking at our measure of dispersion, we're going to be looking at the sum of the squared deviations from the mean. So the expected value of AX is A times the expected value of X, where A is some constant not equal to zero. And so the expected value of AX which is just the sum of AX over N. Notice that if you multiply each of your data values by A, you're not changing the number of data values that there are. So n remains the same. I can, by the property of summation, I can bring the constant a on from the summation. But the sum of x over n is just a sample mean. And that's what I wanted to show. Similarly, the expected value of ax is a times the expected value of x. And so the expected value of ax is just the sum of ax over n which again, I can bring the uh, constant out in front of the summation by the properties of summation. But now the sum of X over N is just mu and that's what you wanted to show. Recall that division is multiplication by the reciprocal. So uh, this follows from property eight, but let me show it anyway. So um, the expected value of AX is 
the expected value of x divided by a, uh, again, so long as you're not dividing by zero. So long as a here is not zero. So expected value of x over a is the sum of x over a divided by n. Right property summation, same as the expected value of x over a divided by n. But the sum of x over n is the sample mean. And so this is just the expected value of x over a, and that's what you want to show. Next, well, again, we already showed this back in property nine, uh, using the fact that if we use the fact that division is multiplication by the reciprocal, but let's show this anyway. The expected value of AX is the sum of X over A divided by N by property of summation, the sum of X over A divided by N. Therefore, <clears throat> this is just the sum of x over n, which is mu. And so this is just mu over a, and that's what I wanted to show. The expected value of x plus a is the expected value of x plus a. And so the expected value of x plus a is the sum of x plus a divided by n. Again, adding a number to all of your data values does not change how many data values there are. So n remains the same. By the properties of summation, the sum of x plus a is the sum of x plus the sum of a. But the sum of a, I can bring the a out front, or I can think of it this way. If I add a n times, I just get n a. Divide each of these by n. So this is sum of x over n, which is the expected value of x plus the n's cancel, a. And that's what you want to show. Similarly, well, um, subtracting the same as uh, adding the uh, additive, uh, additive inverse. And so um, 13 follows directly from uh, 12. But let's show it anyway. And so <clears throat> the expected value, so this is why the proofs are the same because it's they fall from each other. The expected value of x minus a is the sum of x minus a over n by the property of summation. This is the same as the sum of x minus the sum of a. Again, if you add a n times, you just get n a. Divide each of these by each of these terms in the numerator by the denominator n. You should get the sum of x over n, which is expected value of x, minus n a over n, the n's cancel, so minus a. And that's what you wanted to show. 14. Expected value of x plus a is expected value of x plus a. Again, because the formulas for population and sample are the same, the proofs will follow in the exact same fashion. So it's the exact same proof. <clears throat> Expected value of x plus a is the sum of x plus a over n. By properties of summation, this is the sum of x plus sum of a over n. The sum of a, I can bring the a out in front of the summation. So it's just a sum of one, but the sum of one is n. Divide each of these terms in the numerator by, the, by n. So sum of x over n, which is expected value of x. A n over n is just a. And so that is what you wanted to show. Property 15 follows directly from property 14. Again, subtraction by a, is the same as addition of the multiple, well, of the additive inverse of A, adding the opposite of A. So 15 holds from 
property 14. Let's prove it anyway. So the expected value of x minus a is the expected value of x minus a. So the expected value of x minus a is the sum of x minus a over n by the property of summation, sum of x minus sum of a over n. Sum of a, well, I can bring the a out in front. <coughs> so it's a times the sum of one, so what? <clears throat> so a times the sum of one, <clears throat> which is just n, divide each of these by n. <clears throat> so it's the sum of x over n, which is just the expected value of x, minus a over n divided by n, the n's cancel, so minus a. And that's what you want to show. So next, let me give you some rules of thumb. For any distribution, s equaling the sum of the absolute value of x minus a is minimized when a is the median. So um, if you're trying to uh, measure the, your dispersion from a median, then you should use the sum of the absolute, va uh, absolute deviation from the median. <clears throat> mean E, um, <clears throat> the mode is the peak, the median divides your distribution into two equal halves. Your mean is the center of gravity. So if you try to balance, let's say uh, you have a couch. And so you try to balance uh, your, your couch on the tip of your finger, you're really strong. And so that place where you're able to balance your, you know, your couch is called the center of gravity. And so the mean is that point, that's the center of gravity. It is the point where if you try to balance your distribution on that little point, it would balance. If the mean equal medium equal mode, then your distribution is symmetric. If the mode is less than the mean, the median, which is less than the mean, then it will be skewed to the right. If the mean is less than the median, is less than the mode, it'll be skewed to the left. Notice that the mean here is always closest to the tail. And so your mean is closest to your tail. The median always lies between the mean and the mode in these situations. So the mean minus the mode is approximately three times the mean minus the median. And this is true for moderately asymmetric distribution. So this is certainly true for symmetric distribution. And well, if they're just a little bit off from being symmetric, this still works. <clears throat> Note, so why do they call these rules of thumbs? So the above rules of thumb are meant to give some intuition for concepts. They are not meant to be mathematical statements. Uh, they are given without proofs, in fact, as stated, they are mathematically incorrect. So these are not precise mathematical statements. And the first statement, the definition of median must be given along with some additional conditions. In general, the statements are true. <clears throat> when the distribution is continuous, unimodal, and one of the named uh, distributions in this course, but not always. In this is very likely you'll find that uh, the above rules of thumb do not hold for many of the discrete distributions that we'll be encountering in this course. So it's meant to give you an idea. It's not really meant to be mathematically precise. So <clears throat> for a particular set of data, let's see, um, let's verify that some of these 
properties that we've actually proven hold. So. Let X equal the data set 138. And let's show, let's verify that in this case, the sum of X actually is equal to N times the sample mean. So let's find the sum of X. One plus three plus eight, 12. Let's find the sample mean. 12 divided by three is four. There are three numbers. So let's try to show that, well, the sum of X, 12, is equal to N, three, times the sample mean, four. Well, 12 is equal to three times four, yes. So in this case, um, we verify that, yes, uh, that theorem held. Let's show, let's verify for the data set 135 that the sum of the deviation from the mean is zero. So let's find the mean. So let's add up all my data values, one plus three plus five, nine, divided by three, there are three numbers. Nine divided by three is three. So let's find the sum of X minus the sample mean. So let's take all our sample data values, subtract three from them. One minus three, negative two. Three minus three, zero. Five minus three, two. Add these up. Two plus zero plus two is zero. So indeed, the sum of the deviations is indeed equal, from the mean is indeed equal to zero. Let's do an example. No, oh, we've done this before. Um, <clears throat> If X is three, zero, two, one, one, two, five, one, let's determine the sample mean. And so add up all your data values, 15 divided by how many numbers there are, eight. So 1.875. You could use the TI-84, plug in your data, uh, do a curly bracket, uh, plug in all your data values, store it in L1, and then compute the mean of L1. You could find the average, or you could take to itself, do the average of those numbers in Mathematica. You could do the mean of all those numbers. In R, you could do the mean of, well, you have to put it somewhere, so the column of C of those numbers. So we've done those several times. So uh, I think you know how to use those. Let's do the following. Let X equal three, zero, two, one, one, two, five, one. Use the YGO method to compute the median. So first, before you find the median, and this is very important, sort your data. So you must first sort your data. If you don't sort your data, everything else that you're gonna do is worthless because it's going to be wrong. Zero, one, 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 two, two, three, five. So I've sorted my data. There are two, four, six, eight numbers. Eight plus one is nine divided by two is 4.5. One, two, three, four. Halfway between one and two, 1.5. Let's determine the mode, three, zero, two, one, one, two, five, one. There are three ones, therefore the mode is one. Let X equal 30, 36, 41, 210, 350, 28, 35, 31. So Determine the average of X by choosing the best measure of central tendency to determine the average for this set of data. So I gave you some like eight measures of central tendency. What is the best measure of central tendency for this? So 
and he gave you a whole bunch. So there they are. There are these eight. Mid-range, no. Don't use mid-range. Um, we know a lot about, the, we know all the data, so don't use mid-range. Root mean square. <clears throat> well, if you notice, I have some big numbers here that are way, way bigger than everyone else. So I don't want to weight the big numbers uh, a lot. If I weight all the big numbers a lot, then this is going to, oops. I don't want to give undue weight to the larger numbers. And so, no, not root mean square, nor harmonic mean. So those are out. So mid range, root mean square, harmonic. Uh, so root, mid range, root mean square, geometric mean are out. Mean. Well, unfortunately, the mean is not uh, is sensitive to outliers, and those are big numbers. So I want to do the mean either. Mode, mode doesn't exist. Don't do that. Trim mean. Now you would do the trim mean if you suspect that those numbers are in error. They could be, don't know. But you would need numbers at both ends, both big and small numbers. Oops. You would need both big and small numbers that you suspect are wrong. And now I lost it. I hear this. So I, you need to suspect both big and large numbers. They're not, they're only big numbers, I suspect, not large numbers. So I wouldn't do the trim mean. So the only things left, harmonic mean, median. So those are the only two things left. So if you trust that this set of data is reliable and does not contain errors, then the best measure of central tendency for this set is a harmonic mean. Harmonic mean uses all the data, minimizes the effect of the larger data. Uh, if this data set is, you know, so this data set has suspect data that's large, but I don't think it's an error. And so if you don't think it's an error, then you calculate the harmonic mean, 42, 0.1798144, uh, 1455. If instead you do not trust the data, if you think that these are in error, which they might be, because notice they've got zeros at the end. Maybe these are ages. So definitely then that's a no. <laughs> you know, uh, but it could have been that, that the numbers were 21.0 and 35.0 rather than 210 and 350. So it could be that, you know, I suspect that they're in error. And if you have good reason to actually think that they are in error, then you should um, use the median because you suspect that these numbers are in error. If you trust the middle of your data more than you trust the uh, other, the ends of your data, more than you trust the other data values. So if you trust the middle uh, of your data, which is like probably the, uh, like the 30 and the 31, if you trust that middle of your data, then you should use the median. And so sort data, it should be in the 4.5 position. So, so here's the middle of your data, this stuff here. And so, uh, 30, so halfway between 35 and 36 is 35.5. So if you do not, if you trust your data, then um, you should, you get 42. If you don't trust your data and you think maybe it's an error, then you get 35.5. Not, they're really not that far off. So they're, they're, they're relatively similar in size. So the mean for a frequency distribution. Before I figure out the mean for a frequency distribution, let me give you an example to exemplify 
why we're going to give the following formulas. And so, sample mean, sum of x over n is, well, let's see, there are three twos, four threes, and two eights, and two fours. So those three twos give me a six, those four threes give me a 12, those two fours give me an eight, and there's three plus four plus two numbers, so that's nine. So 26 over nine. So my answer is 26 over nine. So if you notice what I'm doing is the following. I'm saying, take the frequency, how many times the two's repeated, add those up. So do the frequency times X and then divide it by M. So the formula for the sample mean for a frequency distribution is sum FX over N, where N is the sum of X. Similarly, for a population mean, for a frequency distribution, mu is the sum Fx over N, where N is the sum of F. Determine, oh, by the way, I should say this. Um, in general, in statistics, you're going to be computing things involving samples. Only occasionally do you know what's involving a population. Sure, the sample mean. So, I have the following I have three twos, four threes, two fours. So, let's compute this. Well, let's add an additional column the Fx column. To calculate the third column, multiply first and second column, two, three, six, three, four, 12, four, two, eight. Add the second column, nine, add third column, 26. So the mean is the sum of fx, which is the third column, 26, divided by n, which is the sum of f, which is the second column. And so I get 26 over 9. Notice that the same way we did above. Good. Notice 3 times 2, 6. So I got a 6, 12, 8. Same 6, 12, 8 here. Uh, 3, 4, and 2. Same 3, 4, and 2 here. So notice that this calculation here is the same as this calculation I'm doing here. So on the 30, oh, well, let's do it on the uh, 83 or 84. Okay, so let me shorten sure see the data. So let's go over to the TI-84. Okay, so let's put in the data. So I'll put in two, three, four, and I'll input and I'll store that in L1. Let's put in uh, the frequencies, which are three, four, two, and let's store that in, oh, I don't know, let's say L2. Then, well, <clears throat> I can compute the mean, second list, scroll over to the mean, third one down, and input L1 and L2. Two point eight. Okay, I could also have done stat, go to calc, one of our stats, L1, oh, and then I put the other one in L2. 
in calculus. So the list, the X was in L1, the F was in L2. Oops, and so you get uh, 2.88, so that's the mean. They also give you all that other stuff. Um, to Excel. I don't know, let's call this X, F, so <clears throat> I'll do it more than one way. So let's put in, uh, what was it, two, three, two, three, four. I mean, three, four, two. So I can find the mean. As doing uh, the following. So I'll just do the sum product. Oh, I didn't give it a name. Uh, some product of this guy over uh, the sum. I didn't figure out the frequency yet, the sum of these guys. Whoop. Some product. Oh, you stupid jerk. The sum product. Okay, so let's just see the sum product. Ah, I'm just so the sum product of this. I'm taking the sum product of those guys. Why is he giving me the sum product of this? Oh, a comma this. Okay, so. I'm going to take some product of this. What the heck? Okay. I'm not highlighting it. If I can highlight it correctly. Okay, good. Some product of this. Good. Some product of that. Okay, good. Finally, finally did correctly. Okay, so it's the sum product of X, F over the sum of F. I probably should have named them because evidently I'm not very good at highlighting. Okay, so that, that is, um, and let's see Mathematica. Professor, is this yes. to get the mean of a sample? So like the population, we just uh, get the average? No, 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 it's the same way. Doesn't matter if it's a, doesn't matter if it's a population or a sample, it's the same thing. This is because it's a frequency distribution. So would it give the same thing if we just use the average for, for mean or it's, it will get a different? It is the average. But what is your data? So if we get the mean of the frequency, mm -hmm. I mean, if we get if we get the average of the frequency, your we do the same thing as the mean. Your data is 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 this? There are three twos, eh, whatever, <laughs> and four threes, and two fours. That's what I'm finding the average of. I'm finding the average of this whole big thing here. Okay. So if I said find the average of that whole big thing, then it's then you'd get the same answer. Oh, okay. So the problem is that the way we've organized our data is not that way. Right, we organize our data as a frequency distribution. So the problem mm -hmm. is that 
if you take the average of that, the average of this is what three, <laughs> right? The average of this guy is uh, three. <laughs> so um, you can't take the average. You've got to take well what we did here, which was the fx column. So basically, what we we did here is we said, well, multiply this times this, right? Add them all up. So then you add these up, sigma. Oh, I wonder if, uh, if you can, no, that, yeah, whatever. There's a sigma somewhere, I don't remember. Oh, there's a sigma. So sigma is equal to, so add these all up. So you just say uh, the sum of that one and the sum of this one. So you could do this and then say, oh, it's equal to uh, this divided by that. Okay. So what you could so do is you could, the, the... yeah. So what, what I did here is I took the product of these and then added them up. That's that weird. That's this. That's this. Okay. So basically, basically the uh, the formula average of Excel is just for the data. But when you have a frequency distribution, you need to use the product of the sum divided yeah. by the sum. Yeah, because it's, it's a sum of products. So you have to use that. They have a sum of products uh, command, which basically is what we're doing, uh, which is, you know, whatever. <laughs> I missed up the formula now. But uh, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I, I destroyed the, the the formula just I did something. Okay, um, so you have to do the some of the product. Uh, you'd have to do this column and this column. Okay. Oh, divided. What is the divided by? What is the divided by? So you'd have to do the sum of the products, which really says, let me get out of there, which says it's the sum of these, which are the products of these. And that's what you're doing. So that's how that first thing in the top becomes this guy. So that's the command you have to use when you have a um, frequency distribution. Okay. Okay. So, um, not Mathematica. Okay. So, let's just call it things. X is two, three, four. Um, F is. Three, two. Okay, so let's find the total of these. Total, <laughs> there's a total there. Of F, X over uh, F. 26 over nine. Oh, wait, do we want it numerically? Two point eight. Okay. Let's go to eleven places. So two point eight. Okay. Uh, let's do R. Again, these are a little bit more difficult because <clears throat> you're dealing with um, 
two, col two, two columns of data. One are, are, is your data, the other is your frequencies. So let's call this X. Uh, two, three, four. And my F, I'll call this three, four, two, three, two. And so let's do the sum of fx over the sum of f, 2.88, okay? <clears throat> There's work. Okay, so <clears throat> that's how you would use technology for that. Sample mean for a group frequency distribution. Sum, so the only difference is, well, we have a group frequency distribution. So we need one number that represents the class. Well, what's the best number to represent the class? Well, the middle of the class. So we'll use class marks. So the, same, the formula is the same formula for frequency distribution, but we're going to be using class marks instead of the value of the random variable. And so the sample mean is just a sum F times X sub CM all divided by N, where N is equal to the sum of F. Same for population. Mu is equal to sum Fx sub cm divided by n, where n is the sum of f. And so let's do an example. Three numbers between 10 and 20, four between 20 and 30, two between 30 and 40, and so. Let's find the class marks. Class mark of the class 10 to 20, 15. Of the class 20 to 30, 25. Of the class 30 to 40, 35. Well, and that's attached to the additional column, the Fx of CM column. Multiply first and second column to get the third column. 15 times 3, 45. 4 times 25, 100. Two times 35, 70. Add. Three plus four plus two, nine, 45 plus 100 plus 70, 215. So my answer is 215 over nine. So um, you do it the same way. It's the same way that we did it for uh, the above problem. It's just that, well, L1 in this case is 15, 25, 35. Actually, the frequencies are the same. And the command is the same. Same for Excel. It's just we have different numbers. So like in Excel, I'll cheat with Excel. Let's go to Excel for a second. It's 15, 25, oops. Let's just see what were the class marks. 15, 25, 35. And so there it is. Uh, <laughs> I just sort of cheated because I didn't need to change anything else. About 23.88. And that's your answer. I just sort of cheated there because <laughs> I already had it in there. Um, same for the, all the other ones. It's just that your, you know, your uh, X is different. So the commands are all the same. So note <clears throat> that actually, if I looked at this previous example, multiply this by 10.
Then then subtract five from it. Do the same thing with the next one. Multiply by two, uh, multiply by 10. Subtract five, 30 minus five. Multiply by 10, subtract five. 40 minus five is 35. And then you look at this, 15, 25, 35, three, four, two. 15, 25, 35, 3, 4, 2. Oh, it's the same thing. Oh, okay, so I multiply by 10 subtracted 5. So note, if I looked at the previous uh, frequency distribution, it was the same as the next one, where my class marks were just 10 times the previous uh, data value minus 10. And so we could use some of the facts that we knew from before to actually compute the mean without actually having to do anything. So the expected value of the class mark is well the expected value of 10x minus five, because that's what the class mark is. But I know that the expected value is linear. That's one of the things that we showed uh, previously today in this section. And so it's just 10 times the mean of x minus five, but the mean of x is 26 over nine. 260 over nine minus five, 45 over nine. 215 over nine, ah, it's the same answer. And so um, using the facts that we knew from previously, we were actually, you would have been able to see that this is the answer that you actually should have gotten. So <clears throat> the, the weighted mean, the weighted mean, so if you look at the frequency, uh, the mean for a frequency distribution, the assumption is that the Fs were counts. And so they were whole numbers. What if I just don't make that assumption? What if I let F to be anything I want? Then I call them weights. So they could be decimals. They could be anything I want. So any sort of number. And so um, the weighted mean is defined as the sum of uh, W times X all divided by the sum of W. So how do I figure out the median? Let's look at the following set of data. And I'm gonna look at it kind of strangely. And so actually maybe I'll So suppose I want to find the median for the set of data. So first, I notice that there are three twos, okay? Next, there are four threes. And there are two fours. Okay. So there's a total of nine numbers there. Nine plus one, 10 divided by two is five. So I wanted to find the fifth number. So I want to find the fifth number. So let's try to find the fifth number here. Well, there are a total of three numbers that have a frequency. Well, so I've gotten up to the number in the third position. That's not the fifth position. Now, 
the cumulative frequency is seven here, which means I've gotten up to the seventh number. The fifth number is somewhere between the third and the seventh number. Since the fifth number is somewhere, since this fifth number here is somewhere between the third and the seventh number, then it must be somewhere in this region. Since all these numbers are equal, then it must be equal to this value. So once I've computed K, I try to figure out the first time that this cumulative frequency is greater than five. That will tell me what the value is of that kth number. So let's do this. Suppose I want to find the median for this frequency distribution. And so I have here the cumulative frequency is, well, three plus four is seven plus two is nine. Nine plus one is 10 divided by two is five. So I want to find the uh, first time that my cumulative frequency is greater than or equal to five when it's seven. Therefore, my median is three. Good. Now, but what bad could happen? Of course, I just erased it. Um, the bad thing that could happen is what if, let's say, it's not, uh, you know, it, it's like in the, this is what, two, four, six, seven. So this is, maybe it's in the 7.2 position. It's somewhere between three and four. Then I'm going to have to do some sort of interpolation to figure out where it's at. So let's look at this example. <clears throat> so let's see what happens in that situation. What happens in the situation where um, you're a little bit past one of those endpoints? Then you're going to have to do some sort of interpolation. Okay, so suppose we have. Okay, one more. Okay. So let's find the cumulative frequency: three plus four, seven plus two, nine plus five, fourteen. So now let's compute the position of the uh, median using the Weibull method. And how? You wait. One more second. Sorry, I had a little bit of a headache, so I had to take aspirin. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> sorry about that. Okay, so uh, the cumulative frequency here, uh, last cumulative frequency is 14, so n is 14. 14 plus 1 is 15 divided by 2, 7.5. So we're in the 7.5 position. So k is 7.5. Let's find the first time my cumulative frequency is greater than 7.5. Ooh, it's greater than, the first time it's greater than 7.5 is here. But 0.5 is less than one away from this. So if you're less than one away, then you're going to have to do some sort of interpolation. We are halfway past this. So what that means is I am halfway in between these two values. So before we said when you're halfway in between, you just add them up and divide by two. Uh-oh. And so let me do that. And so since I'm halfway in between these two, my median is just three plus four divided by two, which is 3.5. I see that I am up. My time is up is the lower class limit for the median class. H here is the class width for the median class. Um, F here is the frequency for the median class. K here is the position. 
of the um, median. And C here is the cumulative frequency for the class preceding the um, median class. So, this. Okay, let's, let's just turn that off for a second. <clears throat> okay, so. <laughs> um, so suppose I have here, well, this is my frequency and here's my X. So <clears throat> I have here, well, oh, of course I'm not sure I'm going to, oh, so suppose that this was the, say, let's say that this here was the median class. So then C here, is the cumulative frequency for the class preceding. Oh, okay. Which tells you, well, this is the, how many, um, what the frequency is for 20 or less, the corresponding frequency for L or less. So at C, I'm gonna put L. Now, the class width here, is H. So if I look at the upper class limit, the upper class limit here, I just, just take L and add to it H. So L plus H. Corresponding frequency, the cumulative frequency, is just what this is equal to, which is the previous cumulative frequency plus my cumulative frequency for this median class. Oh, okay. So, so previous cumulative frequency C <clears throat> plus the frequency of the median class. So the position somewhere between these, remember to find the uh, median, I look at the first time the cumulative, the, um, cumulative frequency is greater than or equal to K. There it is, right there, it's the first time. And so the corresponding uh, value that I wanna find is the median. So I have here two points, this point here and this point here. I'll draw a line in between them. Find the slope of that line. Well, I know how to find the slope of a line. It's just y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So let's do that. So I have here, um, let's say, yeah, uh, let's say that this is y2, L plus a, L plus h minus y1, L, divided by x2, f plus c, minus x1 c. Okay, so now uh, get rid of the parentheses. The l's cancel in the numerator. The c's cancel in the denominator. So you just get h over f. That is the slope of my line. So that's the slope of this line. Oops. That's the slope of this line here. So now by the point slope form, for the equation of a line, I have the following, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. And so let's say that this is the point uh, x, y. And so y is the median. And then uh, let's, let's say that we're gonna pick this point. So I'll pick this point as being x1, y1. So y1 is L equals M, well, we just figured out M, H over F times X. So let's find the corresponding value of X, K, minus C, that uh, minus X1. Let's find the corresponding value for X1, C. And that is the equation of your line. Uh, that gives you the, so, this, well, 
is the equation of your line, and we're evaluating the um, that equation at this particular point because that's what we want to figure out. So let's add L to both sides of my equation, and voila, that's our linear interpolation equation. So my linear interpolation equation is that the median is L, lower class limit for the median class, plus H, class width for the median class, divided by F, the frequency of the median class, times K, the position of the median class, minus C, the cumulative frequency for the class preceding the median class. Well, <clears throat> it will turn out that there'll be several differing formulas that I'll need to use to find the uh, position of the median class. And so, uh, well, the position of the median. And um, it will, well, it'll just sort of depend on, in this case, your location. Uh, or uh, the field that you're in. So if I use the California method, then, uh, and this is called the X sub NP linear interpolation method, then I let K equal N divided by two. So <clears throat> determine the median for the following group frequency distribution using both the California and Weibull method. Uh, usually, if you use the Weibull method for frequency distributions, then the uh, California method will be the best uh, method, the uh, corresponding method to use for a group frequency distribution. But let's see what it is for both of these. So let's use, so first, it doesn't matter if I use California Weibull method. Uh, I still have to find the cumulative frequency. So let's do that. Let's find, figure out the cumulative frequencies here. And so I have, well, three plus four is seven plus two is nine. Good. So let's use the California method. So the California method says that K is equal to N divided by two. Well, I have nine here, n is nine. Nine divided by two is 4.5. Let's find the median class. Well, the first time, my cumulative frequency is greater than or equal to k, 4.5, is when it's equal to seven. Therefore, the median class is the class 20 to 30. Lower class limit, 20. Class width, 30 minus 20, 10. Corresponding frequency, 10, uh, four, I'm sorry. Corresponding frequency here, four. Okay. Uh, K, 4.5. The cumulative frequency for the class preceding the median class, three. So I get 23.75. Next, let's do the Weibull method. So K is equal to N plus one over two. Nine plus one, 10 divided by two is five. Well, again, the first time my cumulative frequency <coughs> is greater than or equal to five is when it's equal to seven. And so the median class is a class 20 to 30. Oh, well, 20. H, again, 10. F again four, K oh, five, Google, uh, C three, therefore we get 25. And so for the Weibull method, it's 25, California method, 23.75. So wait one second. Professor. So the California method is actually this formula L plus H over F. No, 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 K no, no. no, California method is N divided by two. N divided by two. So K equals N divided by two. And then yeah. we get the, what the, we get the uh, uh, 
the position of the median. That's and the then we plug it, and then we plug it in into L. Yeah, we plug into that form. This formula okay. is used for all of the different methods. Okay. Okay. Here, wait one second. Wait one second. Where are the other methods? Oh, I bet you. Okay. Okay. Wait one second. I'm using some old lecture notes. Okay. So wait. Let's see if I have. This is 3.1. Okay, here it is. Let me just see something for one sec. Sorry. Let me just check something. Sorry about this. This thing here or in another section? Yeah, I listed in a different section. Okay. So I didn't have, uh, okay, it's listed somewhere else. Okay, so <clears throat> note that I use the California method for the um, grouped frequency distribution histogram density scale histogram, whereas uh, you will usually use in class um, a Weibull method for a frequency distribution for raw data. So let's find the medium for a density scale histogram. And so I'm actually using the California method for this, even though it's sort of hidden, because uh, I just multiply uh, length times width, uh, the width times the height. So determine the median for the following density scale histogram. And so I want to figure out where, if I start at the beginning, I'll eventually get to 50% um, of my data. Meaning that if I look at all the areas here, they all add up to 50%. So of course, actually, it's the same as going the other way because it's in the middle. but. We always start at the bottom. So let's figure out the area of this first uh, box. 10 <clears throat> times 0.625 is 6.25%, not at 50% yet. 10 times 1.875, oh, that's 18.75 plus the 6.75% is 25% plus 10 times 2.5 is 25% plus the other 25% gives me 50%. Therefore, when I hit 30, I'm at the 50%. And so, um, so the median is located at 30. Any questions about that? Oh. And that is merely a coincidence <laughs> uh, that is halfway between uh, half of this number. I had nothing to do with that at all. I just noticed that. Okay, so uh, the mode for a frequency distribution. So the mode for a frequency distribution is the easiest thing uh, on the planet. Um, the mode is what has the highest frequency, four. The biggest number among all the frequencies is four. Therefore, the mode is three. And you're done. So for a frequency distribution, it's very, very easy to figure out where the mode is. For a group frequency distribution, it's very similar to what I just um, did above for the median. Again, it'll be some sort, you know, I'll be looking at actually where these, I'll take both, uh, I'll take two lines really and see where they intersect. <clears throat> Going from uh, the start to the uh, start of the next one and 
the end to the end of the previous one, and then see where they, these intersect. And that'll give me the mode. So the mode is L, the lower class limit of the modal class, plus H, the class width of the modal class, times F sub M, which is the frequency of the modal class, minus F sub M minus one, which is the frequency of the class preceding the modal class, uh, all divided by two F sub M, minus F sub M minus one, minus F sub M plus one, which is the frequency of the class succeeding the modal class. So suppose I want to determine the mode for the following group frequency distribution. So I just look here, which has the largest value for F. Ah, here, four is biggest. Therefore, 20 to 30 is the modal class. And so L, 20, plus H, well, H in this case, 20 minus, uh, 30 minus 20 is 10 times the quantity F sub M, so the frequency of the modal class, four minus F sub M minus one, the frequency of the class preceding the, the modal class, three, divided by two times the frequency of the modal class, four, minus the frequency of the class preceding the modal class, three, minus the frequency of the class uh, succeeding the modal class, two. And so 20 plus well, four minus four, uh, three is one. So 10 times one is 10. Uh, two times four is eight. Minus three minus two is minus five. 10 divided, well, eight minus five is three. Uh, 10 divided by three is, well, 10 thirds plus uh, 20 is 70 uh, thirds, which is um, 23.33. A uh, warning, many students accidentally, uh, incorrectly, uh, write this as this, meaning they extend this division line too far, or, or they extend it not far enough. So do not write the division line so that it extends too far or not far enough. Um, one little note, the, this formula assumes a unimodal distribution, uh, but it will still work as long as at least one mode exists. And so long as um, you can't have uh, three of these, I guess, having the same frequency all next to each other. Uh, then, then it, again, it, uh, the formula won't work. So in most cases it works, but there are a few cases where it would not work. But uh, the assumption is that, you know, when I derived this formula, it was unimodal, but you can still extend it to almost